ectopic printing dentures that seem kind of out of the ordinary, but it's not hype. We do it all the time. Now, compared to acrylic dentures, I will tell you guys, I mainly use printed dentures as interims or immediate dentures. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jenny, and I'm a part of the education team at Medit. Nice to meet you, everyone. Today, we have Dr. Amab here. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> so a new year has begun. So is there any news or changes from your side? Oh, New Year's resolutions, eh? Um, <laughs> much like everyone, probably just try to be more active and try mm. to work less, which hasn't really started on a good foot. But uh, no, what about you, Jenny? Any New Year's resolutions? Any news? Uh, our education team has become bigger. Because, nice. Yeah, because uh, so many people loved our webinars, thanks to you, KOS. <laughs> awesome, awesome to hear. I'm glad people are liking the webinars. Yeah, thanks to you. <laughs> so today, Dr. Ahmad has prepared a new topic, making the jump from scanning to printing. So do you often print processes in your clinic? Yeah, we've been printing um quite a lot, actually, since about five years ago, we've started printing in our practice. And mm -hmm. now we have a fully fledged lab. We print everything, models, crowns, dentures, splints. Um, and it's quite interesting to see how much the industry has grown, but also how much hype. And uh, I feel like it's like the scanning industry many years ago when it first started, a lot of people are talking about it. A lot of people are trying everything and, and saying it's the next best thing. But yeah. I feel like there's some things that printing does very well. And there's other things that still we need milling machines for. Mm. Okay, then in this lecture, Dr. Ahmad will tell us everything so that uh, all the audience can apply the clinical tips in your daily practice. Okay, sure, begin, doctor. Yeah, let's make a start. Mm. All right, a huge welcome to you all, and once again, Happy New Year. I hope you all had a fantastic holiday period with your loved ones and your friends. Uh, I'm back again for another webinar. This time, it is making the jump from scanning to 3D printing in 2024. And I wanted to cover this topic because I feel like we've talked about scanning so much, and as Jenny mentioned at the start about New Year's resolutions, I think um, 2024 is a perfect year to upskill and, and learn something new. And I think um, for a lot of people around the world, the next logical step after buying a scanner is getting into 3D printing. So a little bit about me, guys. I'm sure many of you have already heard of this if you've logged into the previous six webinars that I've done for Medit. But my name is Dr. Ahmed Al Hasni. I'm a full-time private dentist. I work in Wellington, New Zealand. I actually just finished work today. Um, it's 7 p.m. here in New Zealand, and uh, alongside my brother and my and my father, we run uh, a whole chain of different practices in New Zealand. Um, this is one of our practices, which is uh, our flagship. And um, yeah, we do all sorts of general dentistry from, you know, crown and bridge, dentures, um, full mouth rehabs, orthodontics and, and all sorts. So I've really gotten to see digital dentistry's impact across the entire range of indications in dentistry. We also run a fully fledged lab, which I was telling Jenny about just previously when she asked me, do you guys do 3D printing? And, and honestly, with most technology in dentistry, I think the best people to ask is the technicians because you'll find they have adopted technology much faster than dentists. And uh, here in our lab at IDD Lab, we have five full-time technicians. You can see some of them there. We use everything from Exacad, 3Shape, um, co-diagnostics, uh, dent supply, Serona in lab, and a whole range of different printers. And so many of you may know me because I was the guy who reviewed a lot of scanners. I have basically every scanner in the world in my practice just about, and I continue to review them. Now we're reaching kind of like a tipping point with scanners, I feel that. Uh, it's one of those things where it's a topic that's kind of been done, it's dusted, everyone understands that the future of dentistry is digital and, you know, 
everyone kind of is getting into scanning and it's a, the adoption rates of scanning are skyrocketing. And the next biggest hype topic is 3D printing. And it's a topic that, you know, much like anything in digital dentistry, I really am fascinated by. I really love to see how technology is changing dentistry, changing how we take care of our patients and provide better care. And in our practice, just like scanners, I have a huge range of printers. We've been printing since about 2017, and we started with Form Labs, and now I have a Sega Sprint Ray. We've used the um, Nextent printers, the the printers from Shining, and so forth and so forth. And so I guess one of the first things I wanted to clarify is a lot of people who are thinking about getting into printing may have this question, you know, why do you even bother printing in the first place? What is the point of all of this? Why are so many people talking about 3D printing? And I feel like it's a simple answer, really. And most of us are getting into scanning. I mean, I think the adoption right now in some mature markets is up to 40 to 50 percent. And we will continue to see this adoption increase globally, without a doubt. So a lot of us are getting to scanning and we're at buying scanners and we're digitizing our practice. At the same time, a lot of us have these rooms at the back of our practice. I mean, you know, how common is this, the stone room or the stone lab? And I think this is kind of a, a remnant of, you know, traditional dentistry where you take impressions and you have to pour up those impressions. And I think the, the, you know, old trusty stone room is going to be one of those things that slowly disappears. I mean, I still think we need impressions for some things like uh, completely edentulous patients. I still find them useful. Um, but, you know, because we are all digitizing, the question becomes, you know, we're digitizing our practice. Let's say you want a model. OK, and a model, as we all know, in dentistry is useful for a number of different reasons. Um, these days with scanners, we just communicate with our labs with digital files, but even in-house, being able to fabricate something physical from your digital scan is extremely useful. And that's really where printing comes in. And this is a diagram basically outlining CAD CAM, computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacture. And CAD CAM always starts on the left-hand side. And that's your data collection, your scanners, your CBCTs, X-ray face scanners. And then in the middle, you use apps like the Medit apps or software, CAD CAM software, to transform that data into something that you can fabricate, whether it's a restoration, whether it's a printable model. And then finally, the outsource is basically fabricating something physical. So you go from all the digital things on the left to something physical on the right. And there's really only two main ways of doing this in dentistry, either milling or printing. And milling is a very interesting one. It is the traditional way we fabricate things. Um, well, I shouldn't say traditional because of course there was casting, but in the digital space, milling is the traditional way. And, um, then printing came along. And I think printing is going to be the next big thing in dentistry, primarily because of one reason, and that is cost. A lot of milling machines simply are out of the budget for most dentists. And obviously, with printing, we are seeing a huge, you know, uptake of printers, not only in the lab, but also we're seeing this uptake in the clinic and also a lot of interest in printers and what they can do. And obviously, it's not just about, you know, what you can fabricate and what you can produce. These are some just very rough numbers. And guys, don't quote me on this, but these are just based on some resin bottles that we had lying around and also our communication with a lot of dental colleagues and what this basically tells you is, you know, how much does it actually cost to print something? Now, this is not including the investment cost of the printer. This is just, you know, how much resin cost is it? And as you can see, you know, a study model is a four to seven dollars, depending on the resin you choose. And a lot of you may scoff at that and think, you know, stone is so much cheaper, but I still think you're missing the point a little bit. Um, but moving on from a model for a second, you know, occlusal splint 
is ten to twenty five dollars. Surgical guides five to ten dollars. Temporary or permanent crowns, veneers, etc., ten to thirty dollars a unit. Some of the more expensive crown resins now may increase up to like fifty, sixty, seventy dollars a unit, etc., etc. And and really, what you can see is that there's actually quite a big financial gain in being able to produce things in house. And I see that I do a lot of in house dentistry. I have multiple CEREC units, I have multiple medits, I have multiple trioses, I have printers, I have mills, and I've really seen the difference that same-day dentistry and chair-side dentistry can really make for a practice. And I think what it really comes down to is when you think about digital dentistry as a kind of like an umbrella term, at the you know first step of digital dentistry is getting a scanner. And basically, you're scanning and sending to a lab. And then, you know, if you really want to take digital dentistry on board and CAD CAM on board, in your practice, you'll do full in-house production. And to me, this is like a, a scale. You know, it's like a linear scale where the more things you do in-house, I feel like the patients benefits more. And I'll explain why in some examples of cases. There's definitely financial benefits because you cut lab costs and you have improved treatment outcomes. The turnaround is a lot faster. But you have to note that there is a higher investment cost in training. And so that takes us to why do you even print in-house? And, and as I was mentioning, uh, the first thing is it just cuts lab bills. I mean, as you saw on the table prior, you, you can print a, a splint for 10 to $20. And that I can guarantee is much cheaper than any lab bill you have for a splint. The other thing is turnaround time. I am in control of the whole workflow. I'm not sending it to a lab who, you know, has to service another 200 dentists. If I want to make a splint within 24 hours, I can do that. If I want to make a crown within 30 minutes, I can do that. And it also opens treatment options. Like I was saying, if you start printing in-house, you can deliver restorations very quickly. You can deliver splints very quickly. And the other reason it's actually quite easy. I feel like even I reflect myself, you know, before I got into digital dent dentistry, and this was back in uni, it's quite a, it's quite a complicated, you know, topic on the outside. It seems quite um, intimidating. And I feel the same for printing. Before I got into printing, it's quite intimidating. There's so many different words and new concepts and you're worried about printing something wrong. But hopefully through this, this year's 3D printing series that I'll be doing with Medit, I, I hope to kind of unveil some of that and, and make it, you know, just show you how, how simpler it is. So I guess the next question to answer, a really important question, is what can you print? And I know a lot of us, we go on social media and so we see what our colleagues are doing, but what is it that you actually can print using a printer? What are the real indications that you can actually do if you buy a printer? And this is not an exhaustive list, but just so you know, you can print models, obviously. And you can think of that like your stone models. You can print surgical guides. And I will say printing surgical guides has basically become the gold standard, much better than um, milling surgical guides. You can print digital wax ups. If you are very good at CAD CAM software, you can design wax ups and print them to transfer into the patient's mouth. You can print splints and night guards. And I will say, you know, compared to milled splints and night guards, still there's pros and cons of both. You can print restorations, and that's a big hype thing now with crowns and printing crowns and dentures and, and all sorts of other restorations all on X restorations, veneers, inlays, onlays, everything. And so really how you think of your printer, it's a, it's a whole manufacturing facility in one device. And I think that's also what makes printing so attractive. A milling machine, you're basically going to mill zirconia, desilicate ceramics, and you know PMMA. But a printer, you can print all a huge range of different resins. Fundamentally, they're all resins, but they can have a whole bunch of different indications. And first and foremost is models. And models, guys, is basically the number one reason why you get into a printer. It's not a very sexy topic. It doesn't get a lot of social media traction. Um, but just so you know, the data is very clear because 
as you probably are aware, every company is a data company. They know what we scan, what we print, everything. And it's very clear that the number one indication of a printer is models. And we use models for all sorts of different things, study models, orthodontic models, wax up models, etc. The next thing is surgical guides. I, I, I'm sure you're all aware of what a surgical guide is, what it does. Any of you who are doing a lot of surgical guides or using a lot of surgical guides, I highly suggest you get into 3D printing. It's very easy to print these and you can save yourself a lot of money. Uh, then there are splints. And the number one splint resin right now is Key Splint Soft by Keystone Industries. A fantastic resin, and it is quite an incredible splint resin. I will say when you take manufacturing in-house, you also have to start absorbing some of the issues that can happen, such as if a splint breaks or you didn't design the splint properly. You know, usually if you just scan and send to a lab, if something breaks within 12 months, you complain to the lab. But if you're doing all of this stuff, there's no one to complain to. So you do have to take full responsibility of the entire process. Then there's dentures. And dentures is one of those topics that traditionally seemed like a hype topic, printing dentures that seemed kind of out of the ordinary. But it's not hype. We do it all the time. Now, compared to acrylic dentures, I will tell you guys, I mainly use printed dentures as interims or immediate dentures. Um, but they work. And the beautiful thing about printed dentures is that you can literally turn over something like this within 48 hours. And so this is just not something that was possible with traditional means. And here's another example. This patient came to my office, a very classic example. Obviously, she came as the image shows above and she was telling me, you know, I have a flight in two weeks please, can you create some sort of solution for me? And I'm thinking in my head, you know, where have you been the past 50 years? But that's okay, we'll help her. And, you know, you can't really turn around something like this that quickly, that easily. Um, but with printed dentures, we, we managed to create a, a beautiful denture that even if we were to replace it in three to four months, no issues. And then there's the restorations. This is the hype topic. Everyone is very interested in printing restorations right now. And there's a number of, you know, companies and KOLs around the world that are making a lot of noise about this, about their crown resins. And guys, just to fundamentally understand, all printed resins using chair side printers are, are resins. They're, you're not magically printing ceramic. And so... The only difference between these non-crown resins and the crown resins is obviously the chemistry. These companies do a lot to design new resins, but it's fundamentally the filler content. The more fillers, the harder the crown resin. And um, look, for the most part, how I treat these restorations in my practice is I see them as a indirect composite replacement. I strongly don't believe that a crown resin at this stage is the same product as an Emacs or a zirconia crown. It's just not. But there is a question if it needs to be. Maybe we'll get to the point where these crown resins are strong enough and they last long enough that they're good enough. We don't need 1,500 megapascals. But that time is still coming. It is close. And I think we're getting closer this year. But just as an example, this is a full mouth rehab. You do your preparations, you scan, you design, you print. And these are the printed restorations. And I will let you know, uh, you know, a thing about printed restorations is that they're quite monolithic these days. The aesthetics isn't quite there. And also, if you did want to color them, it's not the same as staining and glazing a crown. It's basically using something like an Opti glaze kit, and you're just staining the surface and light curing it with a light cure stain. Light cure stains don't last. They never really lasted on occlusal surfaces at least, or any force bearing surface. But in saying that, I still do printed restorations. This is my common workflow for any temporary restoration that I want to place, especially in full arch cases. And then you also have your full arch implant cases. And this is really where 
printing shines. And I think this is the gold standard for temporary full arch restorations. It's much easier to print this geometry than to mill it. And you can put it in the mouth and then you can stain and glaze it. And you can, as you can see, there's a, a really clear purpose and indication for printing in dentistry. And then there's a line as a graphy is a is another prominent Korean company. So many very smart Korean companies in digital dentistry, and they're pioneering, you know, direct aligner printing. I haven't used it at a you know extensively. I've seen friends that do it. I've seen labs that have tried to do it. I honestly can't say. I know anyone or any big manufacturer who is doing this on a large scale versus just thermoform aligners. But it's interesting that this discussion is being had and, you know, who knows what the future holds. So that's, a you know, a crash course of the different indications. Now let's talk about how. I want to discuss and, and go through with you how does this all work. And as I mentioned at the start, it's all about data acquisition, CAD CAM software, and then you print. And CAD CAM software has been dominated traditionally by Dent Supply Serona, Exacad, and 3Shape. Obviously, Dent Supply with their CEREC chairside workflow, Exacad, which is acquired by Itero with their, you know, originally a very open software and a very common software to use with Medit. And then we have 3Shape. But the thing is, is that Medit apps are now blurring the lines of CAD CAM software. So you don't just have to use traditional CAD CAM software. This is basically the biggest strength of Medit. I lecture for a lot of different scanner companies and I use all the different scanners. And scanners as an impression device are plateauing. The technology is plateauing. They all fundamentally work, especially for basic cases. But what's separating scanners now is their software. And by far the best scanner software on the market is Medit, thanks to all their apps. I talked about Model Builder in a previous um, webinar, so I won't bore you again with that. But this is basically the best Model Builder software in the entire industry, not just for scanners. Everyone should download this if you're thinking about printing, and everyone should be using this. You have things like splints. So obviously Medit released splints. And, and I think for future webinars, we'll break these down. We'll break down each of, the, of these apps and, and how to exactly print these indications. And of course, Clinic CAD, which was the big announcement last year. And uh, it's a very exciting announcement. And I'm, I'm very curious to see how the Medit company want to develop this and really take on CAD CAM software um, right you know, head on just like they took on the scanner market with their scanners, I think this really has the potential to disrupt the market if they can pull it off. But what Medic Clinic CAD is, is an app that allows you to design restorations. So you can scan and then design a restoration and then print it. And it's totally free, which is even more kind of mind blowing. Now, most of you are still on the fence of, I don't want to design restorations and that's fair enough. Um, I think a lot of you will have to bite the bullet and start touching some form of CAD CAM because there's just no other way to print anything unless you get familiar with CAD CAM software or the Medit apps. But in saying that, AI exists these days. And I've mentioned it in a webinar previously where there's a lot of AI softwares. And one notable software is Dentbird in, in Korea as well. And they make a, a platform that's online. You can upload your scans and the AI will design a restoration for you. And then you just have to pay a small fee, which is a few dollars. And then you export that crown and then you can print it. And so let's assume we have the design ready. Okay, because it's not a CAD CAM software webinar. Maybe we can cover that, how to design crowns in a future one. But let's assume you have the design. Now you have to print. And how does that work? Look, fundamentally, guys, every printer software, or should I say every printer has its own software. It's like scanners. Every scanner has its own software. Every printer has its own software. But you learn how to use one, you can use them all. Very similar to scanners. And so printer software looks something like this. This is the build platform. And you have your file and you basically drag and drop that file into your printer software. 
and then there it is. In this case, is the full arch restoration that we want to print. And then you need to orientate this onto the build platform. And a very simple tip is keep everything, every intaglio surface away from the build platform. And why we do this is because all print supports are attached to the build platform. So you don't want any of these supports in your little screw channels, in your any tissue bearing surface, basically like your dentures. You don't want these in your intaglio surface of the um, crowns. So that's really it. And again, I, I can cover this in more detail, how to arrange something like a splint and a model. But truth be told, guys, it's very simple. I think something like this intimidates a lot of people, but it's just, it takes about 10, 15 seconds to orientate your prints. And with a simple click, you can set up supports. The software does it automatically. Then you basically send this to your printer. That's all you need to do. You just import the file orientate it, set up supports, and then send it to your printer. And then you need to print. And in terms of printing, that takes us to the third question is, what do you need? What do you need to print? And this is basically your stock standard printer setup. You have a printer, a wash, and a cure. This is how printing works. And the printer obviously prints the product, and then this it's it's dripping in resin, so you have to wash it, and then you have to cure it. Much like your composites, it's all the same. It's all resins fundamentally. Except with our composite resins, we don't have to wash them in IPA because they're not soaking in IPA, but we do cure them intraorally. So this is a stock standard printer. This one is Form Labs 3B+. And when you open up any printer, what you'll see is the build platform. And this is basically where any of the builds are attached. And this is basically the, the prints. Anything you print is attached to that platform. And that's the resin tank underneath. When I first got into printing, how I imagined it is how I imagined 3D printing in cartoons, kind of like a nozzle and physically like a printing gun. But... It's not actually how it's commonly done in dentistry. It's actually just a big vat of resin, liquid resin. And then this build platform goes down into the vat. The, the printable is, is cured point by point, either by a laser or an LCD or a projector. And we'll talk about different printers in another webinar. And then it's cured and then the, the whole build platform pulls up and it cures it layer by layer. That's how printing works. And when you look at all the different printers, because it can be quite intimidating, you quickly learn that it's basically all the same. I know these printers have different technology, DLP, LCD, and but fundamentally, they all look the same. They all have a build platform. They all have a shield to cover the, the, the printables from any outsource light, and they all have a resin vat. They're basically a computer on its side with a printing vat on top if you kind of look at it. And all resins work two ways. They either have the cartridge system, which is on the left, or they just use bottles, resin bottles. You can't mix and match these. So something like a Form Labs uses a cartridge system. You can't just physically pour resin. Um, it's where well, actually you can actually squeeze the cartridge to make it fill up faster, but you always have to insert a cartridge. Okay, so with them, with most printers on the market, they use a bottle system, which basically means you uncap the bottle and you just pour it into the vat. There's pros and cons of each. Um, fundamentally, it's just bottles are, are a bit cheaper, but the cartridge system means that the printer is always full of resin as long as the cartridge is full. And like I mentioned, most printers on the market use this sort of bottle system. The main two that use the main two printers that use um, cartridges are actually Prime Print and Form Labs. Those would be the main two on the market. And what else do you need? Wash units, because as I mentioned, after something is printed, you are going to wash it. You're going to wash an isopropyl alcohol, and you just get this from your you know, a, a basically a, a chemist shop or a a um, anywhere that sells kind of these supplies, these these uh, in, industrial supplies. You don't need to get it from a, 
a uh, dental uh, distributor because you just get hit with the dental tax. So it's just isopropyl alcohol. And it's really straightforward. Once your prints are come out of the printer, you have to wash them. And you actually have to wash them twice, guys. A lot of people only do one wash. But if you read the instructions for use, that's actually not acceptable, especially considering things like um, FDI, FDA approvals and, and TGA approvals and all that sort of stuff. So wash things properly and follow the instructions properly. And in terms of wash units, there are a whole lot of different ones in the market. The most basic wash unit is just buying some Tupperware containers and doing it manually. And then there's some semi-automated wash units on the market, like Form Labs, which um, it has kind of like, it really looks like a, a, a deep, deep fryer. And so what it looks like is one of those deep fryer nets and you put your printables in, you press start and it goes down and it washes it. And then there's the really automated ones like Sprint Ray. This wash unit by Sprint Ray is very popular. It washes and dries. I personally think one of the best wash and dry units is actually from Prime Print, but it is locked to their workflow. And the other thing you want to keep in mind with printing is biocompatibility. And what that basically means, guys, this is another confusing thing. It's simple. Some resins are approved for use in the mouth. They've gone through all the regulatory approvals to be approved. And some are not. Typically, your model resins are not. So you want to keep your model resins away from your denture resins, your guide resins, your crown resins, pretty much all the other resins. And so even when you're washing them, you don't really want to wash a model in alcohol and then put a crown in there because it's, it's contaminating it. So always keep in mind that you probably want to wash your, your models completely separate to pretty much every other resin. And if you want to be a real purist, you keep containers for each kind of resin, but that's probably a little too extreme for clinics. And then you have cure units, and cure units are pretty straightforward. Uh, after you print, you wash, and then you cure. And why you cure is that even though the, the printable is hard, it still needs to be fully cured to make sure that there's no, no resin left nothing that's going to leach. The last thing you want is to, you know, make a splint for a patient and they wear it overnight, resin is leaching, and then they have a reaction or something. You're going to get into big trouble if you don't have your entire manufacturing process workflow up to standard. So you really have to follow this carefully, guys. Every different resin has a different wash cycle, a different curing cycle. But the handy thing is you don't need to remember all of this. Most of these good cure units have it inbuilt in the unit itself. So what that means is you just go up to the cure unit, you select the resin you, you printed, and then you put it in there and it has all the presets. But just know, you know, some people use these um, nail, you know, gel nail curing units. All I would say, guys, is just don't be that guy. Uh, you know, when you start moving uh, some in-house manufacturing into your clinic, you really have to keep a very high standard. And it's really up to you to keep that standard. And I would suggest, look, for the safety of your patients, you really need to make sure you're doing the entire workflow properly and correctly. And then finally, it's the 3D printers. So as we all know, there's a whole lot of printers on the market. This is not even an exhausted list. This is nothing. Uh, there's more 3D printers on the market than there are scanners. And we have a lot of scanners on the market. So it gets kind of confusing. How do you choose a printer? And that's something I, I'd like to go through a little bit with you today. Um, just like how I hopefully helped many of you choose a scanner for your practice through our reviews the question becomes, you know, there's really cheap printers and then there's really expensive printers. And are the more expensive ones better? Are they more accurate? Uh, are they faster? And look, in terms of accuracy, I will say that it's it's quite clear that every printer, I shouldn't say every, but most common printers used in dentistry, the popular ones, have been shown to be geometrically accurate. Okay. And you can do calibration tests to prove that. So as long as the printer is set up properly, it will print correctly. The other thing is, you know, why are some printers 15, 20 grand and why are some printers $500 like the hobbyist printers? 
And one thing I have learned, guys, is that especially with 3D printing, yes, you can buy these hobbyist printers and look, for the most part, they work and they work well. There's, there's a lot of prominent clinicians that are making them work very well. But I will say you will trade your time for money because I feel like there's a lot more tinkering with these printers to make them work. And so how do you choose a 3D printer? You know, you go to these expos and you see all these printers. How do you actually choose? What do you need to consider? And first and foremost is how fast. I mean, this was a big hype thing with 3D printers, you know. So, you know, there's a big hype about mine prints the fastest. But I will say for most indications, it really doesn't matter if the printer prints it in one hour or three hours. For example, your surgical guide. You're going to run it overnight anyway. Your, your splint. The only time speed really matters is if you're doing high volume prints, which are mainly labs are doing. And also same day dentistry, that's where speed matters. So if you really want to do same day crowns, you want to make sure your printer can actually print a crown in under an hour or at least 30 minutes, that would be very nice. But for most other indications, it doesn't actually matter as much as people make it out to seem. The speed is not that critical. The other thing is the cost of the printer and the reasons this is more critical. Obviously, there's a global audience watching these webinars and uh, there's a range of different budgets and printers range from a few hundred dollars to tens of thousands of dollars. You want to make sure your printer provides you with the entire workflow. That would be a good piece of advice. A printer alone is, in my opinion, totally useless in dentistry. You need to have a wash unit and a curing unit. And it's fine to use third-party units, but you need to make sure that the workflow is seamless. The software is also important to consider, and some printer software is very good, and other printer software is actually very, you know, it looks dated. It looks like Windows 95. Some printer software has a lot of AI features, and a few clicks, it's something ready to print. Others are, you know, a lot harder to use. Another thing is uh, staff training. And this becomes really, really important when you start moving things in-house. And the reason be is because you, you are as strong as your team. As a dentist, you make your money on the dental chair. You know, you, you really shouldn't be spending hours and hours after work printing. And that's where staff delegation is actually critical. And you can upskill your team. All the printing in our practice is done by our DAs and our labs. Obviously, the technicians are running them, but the DAs in the clinic are running all the model prints, etc., all the restoration prints, and you can teach them this. It's really not that hard, but a good, easy-to-use software is critical. And obviously, size. Some printers are huge. Some printers are small. The footprint really matters. I think, you know, something like an Asiga probably packs the most punch for its footprint, and then some of the largest printers are something like a prime print, which is completely automated, but just be aware of the size of it and make sure it fits in your practice. And then I think most importantly, and I left the most important to last, is actually materials. And guys, to me, it really doesn't matter the printer so much, but what does the printer allow me to print? That's really the key to think about. You need to think about what do you want to print in the first place? Is it splints? Is it just models? Is it restorations? And then you need to figure out what are the best resins for that indication and then figure out which printers allow you to print it. That's how I would choose. Because, for example, some printers are, are very open, like a Sega, over 400 or something validated resins. Some are semi-open, like... Um, Sprint Ray, where they've got their own resins and they've validated a few external resins. Some are just totally a, an open book, like something like the Sonic Mini printers and and uh, Frozen printers. Basically, these aren't really dental printers per se, or at least marketed as that. But you can tinker with the settings to make them print any resin. And then you have some closed printers, like the Prime Print. This is a closed printer. I know they don't like that word, but essentially you can't just use any resin with it. And the validated resins they have is just a small number of around 10 to 15. You also have form labs. Uh, it's another closed printer. So 
when I was mentioning splints, I mentioned key splint soft, which is the gold standard resin. So with this printer, if I wanted to print splints, it doesn't allow me to. But in saying that, in saying that, I still use this printer. It's still amazing, amazingly good to use for things like surgical guides, models. And the company is aware of what the market is doing and they do release new resins like, like a splint resin. So again, it's all about materials. And so do you go for something that's super open or do you just go for a closed workflow if the resins within that closed ecosystem are what you're after? And um, that's a, it's an interesting question. And, and it's like picking a scanner. I get emailed every day by dentists around the world who want to know how to pick a scanner. And um, it really just comes down to your personal needs and your practice. And for those of you who don't know, as we have reviewed scanners in the past, we also have reviewed 3D printers. You can go onto our blog, instituteofdigitaldentistry.com, and we have reviewed basically all the main printers on the market. And this is completely free. You can access this just online on our website, instituteofdigitaldentistry.com. And we've basically ranked every printer, uh, just like our scanner reviews. And so you can check that out if you're interested. Now, for those of you who are thinking about getting into printing, as we sum up the webinar, uh, I know there's so much to talk about, but we're just running out of time. I would just uh, recommend that you consider this and, and getting into printing. I mean, the lowest hanging fruit to me is just models. You need to print models. And I think every practice at some point will need to print models. But going beyond that, something that gives you a little bit of ROI is splints and implant guides. This is the lowest hanging fruit. If you do a lot of splints and you do a lot of implant guides, I would highly suggest you consider um, getting a printer in your practice. And then you can start exploring other things like restorations, smile designs, printing dentures, etc. And for those of you who are interested in this sort of thing, we have a whole bunch of online courses about printing start to finish everything you really need to know to start printing. We are also working on a big, big course this year on digital dentures with a prominent um, denturist in Australia. So that's really exciting. And, and we really just want to provide the resources for everyone out there to adopt and master digital dentistry. So that's basically it, guys. Thanks so much for your time, your attention. Again, Happy New Year from wherever you may be watching this. And now I welcome any questions. Yeah, thank you for sharing all your tips with us, Dr. Ahmad. My pleasure, Jenny. Thanks for having me. Okay, so we've got four questions in total. So we are going to move on to Q&A session. So question number one, do you think owning a printing machine in a clinic is a good idea? If I happen to own a printing machine, what would be the best way to utilize it? It's a good question, and I think it's, um, it may sound obvious, but it's a question that many of us will think about. And again, look, just like buying a scanner, it really just comes down to how much you will utilize it. Mm -hmm. Buying a printer and keeping it in the cupboard in your clinic makes no sense, no financial sense, no business sense. But look, I will just say that I really foresee the day where a scanner and a printer is going to be common practice and commonplace across all practices. Um, and the reason why is that, it, as I mentioned in the webinar, there's just so many indications you can use. Even if you don't believe in 3D printing restorations, um, you can easily get into splints or surgical guides. You can easily get into just printing models, which can be important. And the beautiful thing about printers is you don't need to spend an arm and a leg like a milling machine. It's a mm -hmm. lot lower of a uh, entry point, especially in terms of price, in terms of setup, in terms of maintenance. So without a doubt, I think it's a good idea, but it really comes down to the type of dentistry you do. You know, uh, if you're an endodontist, I don't know what you would use a printer for, to be honest. I know there's endo guides, but they're kind of niche. Um, but for most GDPs, I think it would be a pretty good idea. Okay, so question number two, 
Which factor do you think is the most important when printing a crown? Uh, which factors are most important? I really just think it's the resin and um, the entire mm -hmm. manufacturing process. It's like what I mentioned in the webinar. That now that more and more dentists are doing some manufacturing in their clinic, they really need to hold themselves to a high standard and make sure they're not cutting corners. Um, this isn't like cutting corners with your light cure composites, you know, uh, I didn't cure for 20 seconds per increment. This is a lot more serious than that. When you're making medical appliances, when you're making restorations like a crown, you really need to follow the instructions of use carefully. You need to make sure you're manufacturing it, you're printing it properly, you're washing it, you're post-processing it properly. But in terms of longevity of the crown, I really just think it's a materials game. And we're going to see huge advances this year in 2024 in resins, in printable resins, because a lot of money is going in this industry. You mean entire process is important when printing a crown? 100%. <laughs> You can pick any stage. And of course, look, if you want to go really <laughs> upstream, I think it was like my um, same day dentistry webinar, which if you haven't seen, I did for Medit. Um, it will be in this playlist. Also, the prep is very important, but I suggest you oh. check that webinar about preparation and, and CAD CAM software. Okay. So question number three, what is the best way to restore 3D printing liquid? Uh, in terms of restoring it, I, I in, in restoring the 3D printing liquid, sorry, I don't quite understand. What do you mean, like reusing it or recycling it? No, uh, to store in the... Oh, storing. I thought you meant restoring. Sorry, sorry. Ah, storing. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, look, storing the 3D printed liquid is very straightforward. A lot of these bottles you will see are just basically a, a dark black bottle. Um, and the most important thing of these 3D printing liquids is you just keep them out of sunlight. That's the most important thing. So don't put your 3D printer in the room that has the most sunlight. Um, and equally, don't put your resin bottles there. You just want to store them somewhere out of sunlight. And depending on the resin bottle, just keep in mind that you, some, you have to shake them or stir them quite a lot before mm -hmm. using them. So just regular storage. What about the temperature? Temperature, look, uh, that's a that's actually a good point. I I apologize. In New Zealand, temperature is so mild. We don't have very hot. Oh, we don't have very cold. Uh, um, it really depends okay. on the resin, I believe. I've I've never actually looked on a resin bottle. I actually have a resin bottle right here. Give me one second. Uh, okay. Hey, what? Yeah, oh. we got a resin bottle. Uh, it says the temperature up to twenty eight degrees Celsius and as low as four degrees Celsius. So normal kind normal. of temperature you definitely don't want it to be boiling you don't want it to freeze so kind of stock standard for most dental equipment and most dental consumers yeah. okay so we have the last question question number four is there any clinical tip or recommendation when polishing a printed crown great question um i would go back to what i said originally which is i treat printed crowns basically like indirect composites because fundamentally that's just what they are. They're resins. And really I would just polish it like you do your composites. There are a lot of different polishing sets out there, popular ones by Eve, you know, the dye shine kits and all that. And that's really what I do in terms of post-processing a crown. That's probably a bigger topic and maybe something we can cover in another webinar. Whether you glaze the crown, whether you just polish the crown, whether you do candy coating. But in terms of just polishing a crown, treat it like your usual composites, basically. Okay. Okay, so that was the last question. So thank you for delivering a good lecture for today. My pleasure. My pleasure, Jenny, as always. And mm -hmm. I look forward to the future topics. And I think um, we can really dive deep into these printing topics further. Mm. And for anyone who's interested, please leave us a comment um, about mm. which other topics you want to see on 3D printing, and we'd love to cover them. Mm. Okay, thank you. That's all about it for today. So you'll be able to watch this webinar on our YouTube channel and Medit Academy once it's completed. Thank you for being here, Dr. Ahmad. Thank you, and thanks to the Medit team.
See you guys. Bye. Thank you.